Hi, my name is Joel Philiston, financial coach at Houston Community College Center. I serve here as a financial coach, here to assist students in learning about financial education, mainly how it impacts them um, long term, especially with their student loans. Um, student loans are a big topic because student loans can hinder you from starting a small business. Um, it can hinder you from being able to invest. Uh, so one of the things that we want to do is tackle how the student loans impact your credit report and also understand um, what it is to manage your finances correctly. So today we'll be talking about um, credit reports, uh, talking about credit cards, talking about how to maintain a good credit score, a good credit report, also talking about how student loans have an impact on your credit report. Um, we'll be talking about it from the banking side as well as from the consumer side. So um, I'm looking forward to just giving that knowledge to students and helping students have more opportunities financially while they're in college and once they graduate. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out this afternoon. Um, my name is Joe Philiston. I am the financial coach here at Central uh, Campus. We have financial coaches at each of our campuses. Um, we have one at our North Line campus. We have one at our Coleman campus. We also have one at Southwest and uh, Southeast. Uh, for the central campus system, I'm the financial coach here, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. Our main goal is to help students become more financially educated so that you're making better financial decisions. One of the main reasons that students drop out of college is, anybody want to take a guess? Money, you know, money. Money is a big situation. So one of the things that we do is we have different financial education workshops. We also uh, meet with students one-on-ones to help them set up budgets, learn about credit. Not only that, but just in case a student is going through something or emer a financial emergency, one of the things that we try to do is we try to connect students to nonprofit organizations that might be able to assist at that time. For the most part, I'm just gonna get right into it. And I'll probably just ask you guys, start off by asking you guys, what do you guys know about like credit and credit scores, credit reports, all that, Any, anything that comes to mind? Credit is very important. You have a very big point on that. Credit is very important. And if you don't use it right, you'll be in debt. You'll be in debt for a long time. You'll, you'll have to dodge some calls every once in a while. Like, girl, don't pick that up. <laughs> when they're younger, target for, you know, your credit card. They look at you like, oh, you need a credit card. And they know for a fact that you can spend their money. You know, that's definitely true. It's easy to go ahead and give somebody who's 18 a credit card and you'll watch them just go ahead, purchase some Papa John's, purchase some sneakers, purchase a whole bunch of things. I have a personal story about that, that um, once I got my first credit card in college, I remember a couple of friends and I went out and I had my credit card for three months, hadn't used it yet, but I didn't have money at the time. So we were like, oh, let's go out to a fast food joint. We went to that fast food joint. It's called White Castle. There's no White Castle in Texas. But in New Jersey, we have White Castle. So my friends were like, man, we don't got no money. We can't, we can't buy food. And I looked at my credit card like, it's on me. <laughs> and I felt like a baller for the day. But of course, I had to pay that back a few months later, well, a month later, when they called me like, you owe us money. I was like, who are you? Stop. Why are you, why are you calling me? How do I pay you? So one of the goals is just to help you understand like how to use your credit cards responsibly, how to use your student loans responsibly, all of that, all of those things. That way, like you said, you're not in a situation where you have too much debt and you can't pay it back. So to start off, I'm going to give you guys a quick little scenario, all right? Um, I just want to see where your minds are at. I just want to see what you're thinking, all right? So I'm going to read this out to you. Your cousin Michael just walked into your house. He asked you to borrow $500. Michael is currently not working, and two months ago, he borrowed $200 from me. He tells you that he really needs the money, and he will pay you back. Would you lend him the money? By a show of hands, how many people will lend him the money? I got cricket. Oh, you, you might. You might. He family. I got you. OK. OK. We got one because he family. All right, so, all right, so we got two for right. <laughs> So we got one. We got one out of, uh, what is it, out of six people, all right? One out of six, okay. Let's go ahead and look at the other scenario. Your best friend Frank is currently working a full-time job and a part-time job. He comes over to you and asks you to borrow $400 and he will pay you back in a month. Frank is pretty good at paying you back, but he always takes a long time to pay you back. 
Once, you had to stress it, stress it to Frank that you needed the money you lent him to pay for an emergency. Would you lend him the money? So he's working, he pays you back, but he pays you back late. How many people? How many people will lend it to him? Show of hands. We got, we got two, we got, we got three. We got three, okay. That's charging some interest, right? <laughs> well, but, but, you know, okay. Maybe you like you think about it, right? All right, let's see. We got about half of you said you would pay him back, so you know it increased a little bit. Let's look at this last um, this last situation. Your brother stops by. Your brother always pays you back when he borrows money from you. He has recently run into a tough time. You don't have much money yourself. Would you lend him the money? Yeah. Yes. Mostly everybody say yes. It's a big difference between cousins, friends, and brothers. That's a good point. You guys have a good point. So one of the things, I'll break it down for you. Some of the things that banks look at when they're saying, am I going to lend this person money? It's number one, the relationship. How long has this person been a customer of my bank? Sometimes they think about that. Is this, a, is this a long time relationship? So one of the things that you want to do is you do want to build a relationship with a bank. And maybe it might be a credit union, a financial institution, but when you're thinking about lending, sometimes they think about the relationship because at least then they could see your accounts, how they monitor your accounts. Just like we see that there's a relationship between brother, cousin, friend. Brother, cousin, friend, you're going to lend money to your brother much more quickly than you will to your friend. So the same thing goes into banking. If I have a long term relationship with you, I might be willing to lend to you more. Now, it doesn't, that's not a big factor in it. But it's, a, it's good to be faithful to your bank. It, it is good to have a, finan a main financial institution. Meaning, like switching from one bank and then leaving it in a small debt and then go to another and then go to another. Exactly. So that's the big part about it is sometimes it does come down to that relationship on whether they'll give it to you or not. But then we had some other situations. We thought about, all right, in the first instance, we know this person does not pay us back. <laughs> we know that this person does not pay us back. That's like that one friend who was always like, let me hold something. And you're like, what? <laughs> you? <laughs> you don't pay me back. Yeah. So because you don't pay me back, why would I give you money? Something that a bank thinks about. So when people don't pay back their loans or they don't pay back things on a regular basis, automatically you're getting rejected for things. But then we saw different situations where we thought about late times and all of that. But that's some of the thinking that a bank goes into when they're like, all right, do I want to lend this person money? Now, credit is just the ability to borrow money from um, a financial institution. Basically, when you don't have enough money to either you know, start a business, purchase a home, purchase a car, or whether it's just a credit card to use it for everyday purchases or like spending it on a vacation, Credit is that ability to go ahead and borrow. A bank will say, or a financial institution, I should say, they'll say, here's this money, just pay us back over the next few months, right? Now, at the end of the day, that just makes you the borrower. You're the borrower, and what's their requirement of you is that you pay them back. Now, if you do good, what they'll be willing to do is pay you back over time, just like with our examples. When we started off with our examples, we looked at, all right, well, this person could pay you all. This person always pays you back. This person sometimes pays you back. This person never pays you back. The same thinking that you had where you was like, I'm not giving money to this person because they're not going to pay me back is something that a bank will think about too or a financial institution. So some of the consequences of bad credit. What's some of the consequences? Higher interest rate. Higher interest rate. Can't get a loan. How many people knew about that second point? Yes. Rejection of employment. Yes. Rejection of employment, apartments. So for example, you go, you graduate with a 4.0, GPA looks great, and you're going into a financial institution, you're like, man, I'm going to nail this job. Your interview skills are out the roof. And then you kill the interview. You, you killed it. I mean, it was perfect. And then they tell you, well, one thing that we require of our employees is that they have a fair credit score. Not even a, not even a you know, great credit report, but they just want to see something fair, meaning that you know, you're getting by, you're not doing too bad. And then when they look at that credit report, they're like, ooh, you don't pay nobody back. <laughs> and one of the reasons why they look into a credit report, why jobs or apartments look at a credit report, credit tells me how trustworthy are you. Now, if you pay somebody back, I can trust you. If I give you like, 
you're efficient. You're efficient. I can trust you. I'm like, all right, you know, Tracy. I'm going to take Tracy because I know Tracy. <laughs> Tracy, I gave you $100 like two months ago, and you paid me back a week later. I trust you to give you extra money. Now, if Tracy didn't pay me back, I'm like, listen, this bridge is burned, girl. Don't talk to me again. You're not borrowing money from me again. It's the same concept. And that's why credit is really important. That's why a credit report becomes important. That's why where your credit score lies becomes important. Because some of those opportunities that you want in your future, such as buying a home, such as getting a car, all of that comes down to you managing your credit correctly right now. Now, the goal today is to talk about some of those ways to go ahead and manage your credit, how to check your credit report, what's some ways to establish credit, what's some of the uh, things we need to do to even understand a credit report. So let's start off with this. All right, you go into a bank. First thing that they're thinking, there's something called the five C's of credit. Those five C's are very important. First thing is character. And we're going to touch each one. It's character, capacity, capital, collateral, and conditions. Those are the five C's. Immediately, that's what a bank thinks about when you come in and you ask for either a credit card, credit report, all that good stuff, right? So let's check it out. First thing, we'll cover character first. Character. Looking at somebody, looking at this picture, would you lend him money? <laughs> Be like, ah, Uncle Charles, stay away from me. <laughs> right? Uncle Charles, no, you're always asking me for money. So one thing that a credit report does, it tells somebody, it tells an organization, what is this person's character? Is this person trustworthy? Because just like we talked about, it's all about trust. If I give you some money and you pay me back, I can trust you. So what a credit report basically breaks down to people is, is this person going to pay me back? Now, if it's somebody, now, we might be discriminating against this gentleman. Of course, I discriminated a little bit. <laughs> but at the end of the day, if this person isn't going to pay you back, then you don't want to give them that loan. And that credit report will tell me that. Because a credit report, what it does, it breaks down if you're repaying people every month. And if you're not repaying people every month, they can easily tell, like, I'm not going to give this to you. So that's where the first C and these five C's are, what's your character? Are you going to pay people back? Have you paid people back in the past? Second thing, capacity. Anybody want to take a guess of what capacity is? I got you. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> capacity means, do you have the money to pay me back? So all right, you come to me and you ask me to borrow money. At the end of the day, if you're not working or if you don't have a business, something of the sort where you have income coming in, how are you going to pay me back? Or a savings account. Or at least a savings account, right? How will you pay me back? So one of the things that you might want to be careful for is if you're going in to apply for a loan or a credit card, whatever the case may be, if you're not working, the chances are slim that you're going to receive that credit card or credit or that loan. Because one of the quick questions I'm going to think is, so how much you make a month? Anybody ever fill out an application for a credit card or any type of loan? One of those questions that they ask right out is how much you're making per month. So that's one of the things that you want to think about. Do you have capacity to pay, repay this loan? Capital. Anybody know what capital is? What you, have to down. what you have to put down. What have you saved? What's your down payment? Now, let's say we were going to purchase a car right now, right? And we just went to the dealer and we said, well, I have an uh, 800 credit report and I want this 30,000 car. And you got the job for it, right? This $30,000 car and you're like, yeah, I got the job. I can pay it back and everything. Now, they may look at you and say, I don't know. You know, they have a job, but maybe they can pay me back, maybe not. Now, if you come into it and you're like, well, look, for this $30,000 car, I'll put $5,000 down to show you how serious I am about this car, meaning I took my money that I worked hard for and I'm going to put it down. You putting that money down lets me know that you're serious about this. Just like anybody who starts a small business. I work for an organization that helped people start small businesses before I worked here at Houston Community College. And one of my jobs was to look at people's credit reports, tell them what they needed to clean and everything along those lines. Now, anytime one of the business owners were thinking about going to a bank and asking for money, 
they always wanted to know, what have you put down? What have you saved to go into this business? Because then I know that you're invested in it. You've worked hard for this money, you're taking money that you put in your pocket and you're investing into this car, you're investing into this, you're investing into that. Whatever the case may be, now I know that you're serious. But if you're just coming to me like, give me the money and if I don't pay it back, it's up to you to take the losses. See what I'm saying? That's what capital comes down to. Capital is basically telling the bank that you're serious, that you put this money down. Next thing, collateral. Anybody know what a collateral is? Essentially your assets. Your assets? What else? What about your assets? The value of assets. Y'all close, y'all close, but y'all not there yet. Y'all close. Is it something to compare um, what you might be trying to um, get loaned to you? Uh -huh. Something with value that can be... Right there, right there. That could be taken back. That could be taken, that, that, that makes that could be taken as value for the um, same amount that you're trying to get home to. Perfect. Right on, the, right on the dot. If you don't pay me, at least I could take this away from you. So what's some forms of collateral? Your house. House, car, jewelry. If you have a, a loan on jewelry, although it's going to be hard to take jewelry on somebody. <laughs> Now the car and the, the house, you can take that easily. But sometimes a lender feel more, feels more comfortable giving you a loan on something that they can take back from you. That value, because now they can resell it and recoup their losses. Last thing, this doesn't have anything to do with the consumer or you. It's something called conditions. Anybody know what I mean by that? The state of the economy. The state of the economy. Remember 2009, anybody? I don't know if everybody remembers 2009. I was in school at the time, I was, you know. About to graduate, I was like, I'm out of here. But I remember at that time, they was talking about how the job market was bad and no one wanted to give loans. Now, right now, we have a much better market. People are willing to loan again. But sometimes that decision of whether a bank will give you money comes down to this right here. If there are enough jobs in the economy, if the economy is doing well. So this is what a bank's thinking is when they're saying, all right, we're going to lend money to someone. Now, what we could focus on is, the main point is a bank wants to make sure that someone can pay them back. The same way you think about it, the same way you think about it, if I give money to somebody, I want somebody to pay me back. Same thing that a bank thinks, same thing that any institution that you borrow from, furniture loan, whatever the case may be, they're all thinking, I want you to be able to pay me back. Now, this is just a little comedy, I don't know if y'all got it, but you know, the look that you give someone when they owe you money, it's kind of funny to me. I don't care if it's funny to you guys. <laughs> it's funny to me, all right? But we'll move on. And now we'll talk about some credit bureaus and how it affects you, just like we talked about from the bank side, all right? <laughs> so we start off with you. I love having this laser. All right, we start off with you, right? <laughs> so it all starts with you. You apply for a new bank, me uh, for a loan, right? Maybe it's a credit card, maybe it's a car loan, maybe it's a house, maybe it's a business loan, whatever the case may be, you apply for it. Immediately what the creditor does is they go to the credit bureaus. That's where your credit report and credit score comes in. And they're saying, does this, people, does this person pay people back? The credit bureau then takes the time to look and see, are you doing that? Once they get that information, they go right back to this creditor and they say, okay, well, Based on this information, you have to make a decision, and they make a decision. That's the whole credit system. Anytime you apply for something, the uh, creditor is going to go to the credit bureau. The credit bureau is going to say, this is what I have on this person. And then at that point, they decide whether they want to approve you for a loan or not. So one thing that we have to do is we have to be able to check our credit reports. Since the credit bureau has information on us, that's where we have to track what am I doing as far as me managing my credit? Now, some of you might be in a position where you have no credit. One thing I will tell you, if you are in a position that you have no credit, that's a good thing if you do not have no credit. Now, will it get you, you know, a 30,000 car loan? It won't. But what that means is you have a chance to build your credit. That's why it's good not to have credit. A lot of people are like, I don't have no credit. That's bad. No, it's not bad, actually. It gives you the chance to start over. Now, if you have good credit, of course you're good. If you have bad credit, ugh, it's going to take a little bit of time. <laughs> we could rebuild. But at the end of the day, it's all about you having that mind frame of I can rebuild. I could go ahead and improve my credit score. Now, 
These three organizations right here, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, those are your credit bureaus. Anytime you apply for something, whether it be you know, a basic loan, whatever the case may be, this is who creditors will go to to decide, do I want to give this person credit or not? Some of the things that they ask when they go to a credit bureau or when they're looking at your credit report, are you always asking to borrow money? How long have you owed? Do you pay people on time? How much do you owe? Those are some of the questions that come up in a creditor's mind immediately. Now, one of the things that's good about a credit report also is that you have rights to a credit report. So let's say you have negative information on your credit report, right? Basically, there's something called the seven year removal rule. If you have bad information on your credit report, after seven years, it comes off. So if there's negative information, what we call like an adverse account, that's, that comes off after seven years. 10 year removal uh, rule. If you like file for bankruptcy, bankruptcy is whenever you are just stressed out financially and they decide, well, you decide to apply for bankruptcy through the US court system where they'll wipe out all your debts. That goes on your credit report also. But what happens is they don't remove that after seven years because that's much more severe because you're not paying anyone back. So there's a 10 year removal on that. Now, one thing that's good about a credit report that's very important, very, very important. This is why you should check your credit report every year. When I mean every year, every year. You have the chance to dispute information that's not true about you. So, for instance, we heard about, how many people heard about the Target scam? There was like a scam a few years ago where Target had people's credit card information and people's information was compromised. So basically, people were taking other people's credit cards and just swiping it and not repaying those loans, that those, you know, those loans or that credit card back, right? So, of course, if you're not repaying what you just, was just been swiped, what's gonna happen to your credit score or credit report? It's gonna go down, it's gonna hurt you. Through the credit bureaus, with you being able to check your credit report every year, you could go ahead and look at information and be like, hey, this information is not correct about me. That's one of the perks about being able to go right on, your, uh, right on the credit bureau and check what's true about me. Do they have inaccurate information? Is this information true? Now, if that information is not true, once you dispute it, what you have a chance to do is have that removed and that could boost your credit, uh, credit score. So that's why you want to check your credit report every year. Basically, the credit bureaus always make money. The, re the reason why the credit bureaus will always make money is because banks always have to go to them to get information from them. Now, for what it is, the credit bureau is a business, so they want to make money off you too. So after you get your one free one, they want to go ahead and charge you about $10 to get another one if you need another one within a year. So that's why it comes down to them charging you. But take advantage of the one free one, and if there's inaccurate, on your inf inaccurate information on there, you can always go back and say, well, there's inaccurate information. I need to start a dispute. That's why I'm, I'm applying for another one. Now, one thing about rebuilding your credit report is that if it's if it in fact is inaccurate information, definitely you want to dispute it. Now, if you actually owe on this account, one thing that you might want to do is reach out to the creditor and say, all right, can I get a debt settlement where they'll let you pay less to, to just go ahead and close the account? It's still going to stay on your credit report for seven years at that point. The only way they can remove something is, is if it's not actually yours. TransUnion, Equifax, Experian, they all give you a chance to go right on there. Now, one thing I'll give you guys a chance to see, I'll show you some of the things that are on your credit report. So this is what a credit report will look like. Basically, it's going to have your name, going to have your social security information. It's going to break down all of that. Now, some of the things that you'll see, you'll see, you'll see that it has your employment history. So now I know whether you're working or not. Not only that, it's going to break down right here What's some of the reasons that your credit score may be suffering or maybe why is it okay? Now, if you don't have too many messages, such as an ID mismatch alert, um, it'll break that down. It'll make sure that this is clear. Basically, OFAC is just making sure that um, you're actually who you are and that there's no issues as far as like citizenship, stuff like that, all right? 
Now, for instance, here, this is the type of credit report that you'll order directly from, um, from the credit bureau. And basically, those cr credit reports will have a credit score on them. The one that you order through annualcreditreport.com doesn't have a score. It just shows you your credit report so that you can go ahead and dispute information if you feel that information is inaccurate. This is one of the credit uh, reports that you actually pay for. So you might pay $10 for this and they'll make you pay for the score. Um, but you have other, you know, you have different websites out there now such as Credit Karma, uh, Credit Swiss that will give you a free credit score. But right here, it breaks down, for example, revolving. A revolving account is something like a credit card. The reason why they call it revolving is because they think of it like a revolving door. Um, when you go through a revolving door, you can go in and out as much as you want to, right? Everybody got it? That's a revolving door. Now, a credit card is just like a revolving door. As long as you pay back what you borrow from it, you can use it as much as you want. That's why it's like an in and out type of thing. That's why they call things like credit cards, anything where you can like swipe it and then you can repay it back, that's a revolving account. An installment account is something like a car loan. Once you borrow money for a car loan, they only give you the money once and you only repay it back. You pay it back in installments is what they say. Everybody got that? That's clear? Now, basically the way your credit report is gonna look, for instance, like public records. Anytime a creditor takes you to a court, it becomes a public record. That's what it comes down to. And this is like negative information. So if you have a collection or if you have a public record, that means that somebody either took you to court or they referred you to a collection agency. One thing that you want to do, let's say you're behind on a few credit card payments or a loan payment, whatever the case may be, fight so that it does not go to a, uh, a collection agency. Call up the creditor. If you ever fall back on credit card payments, whatever the case may be, call your lender. If you call your lender, they are willing to work out a deal with you. The reason why they're willing to work out a deal with you is because when they sell it to a collection agency, they're selling it for pennies on the dollar. They're selling it for a very cheap price. So at the end of the day, they're more willing to work with you. So one thing that I would stress is that you call your lender. Now, right here, this is just breaking down all your payments and everything. For instance, if you have like this account right here, trades or call accounts, all right? So, with this loan, I could automatically tell it was a car loan. It'll break it down as far as whether it was an automobile, whether it was a credit card. So we start off with automobile, right? Then after that, I have this section right here. They tell me what was the worth of this, of this loan. So this loan was worth $16,900 um, right here. And then it tells me the terms. This person was supposed to pay this loan for 60 months, $282 every month. That's what some of those things mean. And I'll email all this out to you guys and you guys can feel free to come in and I'll break it down again. But basically these, two, these sections right here tells you the information regarding the loan. Now, whereas this is what you borrow, this right here tells you what the balance of the loan was. So the balance remaining was 12,900. Here, this breaks down whether you're paying it on time or not. So, for instance, you see right here where it says all these ones? I could tell that that person was paying their loan back on time. Sometimes it'll say okay or it'll say it'll have a one. Those ones mean, all right, paying on time, paying on time. Now once it becomes a two, right here, it's a little hard to see, but this is a 30 day. The two basically means that you were 30 days late. The three means that you were 90 days late. Four means that you were over 90 days late. So now when we're looking right here, over these past two years, we see the person started off and they were paying it pretty much on time. And then at one point, they became 30 days late. Then at, after that, they went into being 90 days late. And then we see this pattern where they're not paying it back on time. That's what you'll see on a credit report. Just helping you understand like, all right, what's on my credit report and how do I fix it? Now someone like this, I would tell them, you know, just make payments. Find a way to work, out, work it out with your creditor. Say, all right, how can I make some payments to get caught up? Now, we saw a credit card. Another thing that I would tell you that's important on here, it's not on this particular one, 
But your student loans, how many people know your student loans are on your credit report? Did everybody know that? Student loans get reported? If it's loans up, you go to the bank, like, if you try to get your loans, and you go to your credit report. Now, it's going to be on your credit report. That, it is going to be on there, but as long as, for, for one, if you're in school at the time, you don't have to worry about it negatively impacting your credit report. What they're going to do is they're going to keep reporting you being in a deferment or in school for, uh, deferment. So you don't have to worry about that time. At that time, what it'll probably do, it'll show either an OK or it'll show a 1 or it'll show an X because it'll say that that X means that no information was reported. One website that I'll tell you guys about is nslds.ed.gov. I'll write it down right now. This website is very good as far as finding out how much student loans have you borrowed, um, how much uh, Pell Grant funding you have remaining. It's a Department of Education website. So all the student loans that you borrow, Pell Grants, they all have a limit on them. So for instance, your Pell Grant, you could only use your Pell Grant for six full-time years, right? Um, it comes out to 600%. Basically, they break it down by a percentage. That 600%, once you reach that 600%, you can no longer receive Pell Grant funding. Same thing with student loans. Student loans have a, have a limit. If you're a dependent student, then that limit is $31,000. Once you've reached the limit of $31,000, they will no longer pay you uh, student loans for your tuition and for your classes. Independent student is $57,500. So if you hit that limit, you can't get paid, uh, you can't get loans anymore. Now, nslds.ed.gov breaks that all down. So I would encourage everybody who has financial aid in here to check out that website to make sure that you've received, like all the loan funding that you receive is actually you, just in case it's not you. The main thing that I wanna tell you guys is like, when you're thinking about your credit report, the student loans that you get right now, they do have an impact on your credit report. You know, and I'm not saying that it's a negative impact because when you pay your student loans back on time, it actually boosts your credit score because, well, we should move on to the next part, actually. <laughs> Let me get over here. If you pay things early, does that help you as well? Does that boost your um, credit score up even more or is it the same as paying on time? Or is it better to pay on time than it is to pay early? Basically, paying early is paying on time. The sooner you repay a student anything, anything yeah. the better it is for you because it's showing that you have that responsibility and that you're trustworthy. So you don't have to wait for a due date necessarily and you don't have to just pay, by, uh, pay the minimum balance due. If you pay more than the minimum balance, what happens is you'll be repaying that loan sooner. So that's why you, honestly, you want to pay more than what's due at any point, like if it's on a regular, like a car loan or something like that. Credit card, what you want to do is you want to pay every month that you've borrowed it for. Let's say you borrowed it for February and your statement came March 19th for you to pay it back. The best case scenario is to pay it at that point and that's going to be what's best for your credit score. But you do have the opportunity to carry it over because they charge you, the, they'll say pay the minimum. That's how they make interest on you. This is a credit score breakdown. This is how they figure out what's going to be your score. So the first thing that matters when it comes down to your credit score is this portion right here. This 35% payment history. That is the largest chunk of your credit uh, score. When they're thinking about calculating your credit score, they'll look at the credit report and then they have basically like a, was a mathematical formula. In that mathematical formula, they're like, all right, well, let's look at it. If this person is paying their paying every 35% of your score comes from that. So once you pay late, it has an impact on you. So that 30 days late, that 60 days late is going to hurt you. So that's why you want to make sure, first thing, to maintain a good credit score, pay everything on time. Just like you were saying, you could pay it early, you could pay it right on time. Now, if you pay it late, 30 days late, what they consider late is being 30 days late. Once you pay it 30 days late, that hurts your credit score, all right? Second thing, amounts owed, how much do you owe? Let's say I give, you have a $10,000 credit card, right? And credit card limit. 
This is your credit limit. And currently, you're carrying 8,000 from month to month. You owe 8,000 month to month. All right? Now, basically when a credit creditor is looking at your account and they're saying, all right, how much does this person owe? What they're going to see on this credit card is that you owe 80% of the bound, 80 percent of the limit. Everybody with me still? Yeah. With that 80 percent, what it's telling me, it's telling me that it doesn't take much for you not to repay me, especially if you're just paying the minimum balance. Basically, if, what they'll see is all it takes is for one thing, bad thing to happen, and this person might not be able to pay me back. Because the amount that you owe is consuming most of this limit. Everybody got that? So the amount that you owe is very important. One of the ways they evaluate, like your short-term credit, they take the time to look, all right, what percentage of funding do they owe back? Now, if it's a credit card, it's easy to tell. Of course, with a car loan, a car loan is a little bit different. It's kind of hard to tell because it's not based on the percentage. It's more that you just got to pay them back. But credit cards, this is how they evaluate this. What amount do you owe? Do you owe 90% of this card? Do you owe 95% of this card? And if you do owe too much of a percentage, basically, that's where they impact you, it impacts your credit score negatively. Everybody got that? So one of the things that you really want to make sure is that you don't owe too much on your credit limit. You want to make sure that that's not happening. Now, next thing, length of account. Remember how earlier we started off by talking about whether you have a relationship with somebody? Now, if I look at your credit report and I see you've had a credit card for five years, that lets me know that you know how to manage credit card. At least you had this account for some time. Somebody who just got a credit card within six months I might, and they come to me and they're applying for a car loan, I might be like, uh, do I really know that you can manage credit yet? <laughs> you know, you just got into this game. A credit card is seen as not being income, but ex an extension of income, right? Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is this credit card isn't money coming in monthly. It's not income. Right. That's, yeah. But let's say I have this vacation that I want to pay for. And I can't afford it right now. Like, I can't pay out that $10,000 off the bat. But I have a $20,000 credit card in my hand that I could put this payment on. What that gives me the chance to do is go ahead and pay for the card and just pay it back over time, which is the purpose of credit. Now, when it comes down to you making that decision, you do have to ask yourself that. Am I going to go crazy with this credit card? If you feel that you're going to go crazy with it, <laughs> <laughs> First thing that you might want to do is, you might want to say, I'm not going to get it. Or you might want to say, all right, maybe I need to develop the discipline not to use it. Not only a credit card, there's many different ways to build a credit score. So for credit card, uh -huh. it's helpful to build your credit It is helpful to build your credit score, but that's, that's anything. The other purpose of a credit card, the real purpose of a credit card is I don't have the money right now to purchase a certain thing, so instead what I'm going to do is use this credit card and I'm going to pay it off over time. So it depends on what you're going for at the time, you know? Um, I just got a credit card and um, I was going to and we said, okay, if I want to spend it for like $50, we pay that card. Or it's better to spend more. No. Uh, no. Limit no. And they, uh, pay. Yeah. So I understand where you're going with it. You're saying like, what's the best way to build the score? Mm -hmm. At that point, what you should do is, all right. Let's say you, just like you said, you have a cell phone, uh, cell phone bill, for example, right? You pay your cell phone every month with it. But in turn, at the end of the month, when they send you the statement, what you want to do is you want to pay it back at that time. Not like. Not within the cycle, so there's two things. There's paying it within the cycle and there's paying it once the cycle has ended. So that, what I mean by within the cycle is, I, I just paid my cell phone today. Tomorrow, I go ahead and I pay off my credit card immediately, mm -hmm. right? 
that's within the cycle because they never sent you the bill that you owe this money to me. So that's more, it's, better to it's better to wait until they send you the letter stating that, hey, you have to make your payment. At that point, interest still hasn't been calculated into it. So usually, like, we're in October right now, for example, right? So let's say the cycle ends in November 5th, and then November 9th, they send you that payment. You pay it at that point because it hasn't accrued interest yet, but at the same time, the cycle ended, and now you repay it. And it shows that you have paid for this deal. You, you have paid it. To help your credit out. Exactly. What is it? I just said, if you pay it after the cycle, it shows that you're paying a deal. Yeah. And that's what helps your credit. Correct? Exactly. So you have to owe it first? Because if you pay it within the cycle, let's say I, I spent it today, but it ends November 9th, I already spent it, but at the same time, I never showed that I really owed it. Because the credit bureau, what they're gonna report on is what you actually owed. And by November 9th, that's when the cycle actually ends. So at that point, that's when they reported that, you know what, this person owes us $90 out of this $500 credit card, but then they paid us on the right date. I spent $50 or I spent $100 or I spent $200. Be careful with it. I always say do something that's manageable, especially if you're starting. Yeah, like if you're starting credit, like you're starting to build your credit, right? So the best thing to do is you pay your cell phone every month. You got to account for that out of your budget. I'm going to pay my cell phone every month, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, you're prepared to pay your cell phone. Basically, what you should do if you're just now establishing credit is, all right, I'm paying my cell phone bill every month. According to my budget, I'm able to pay it every month. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use my credit card to pay off my cell phone bill. But I already had the money to pay my cell phone. I'm going to wait until the statement comes in once that cycle is ended, and now I'm still going to take that $100 that I already had put aside and pay this off. But one thing about using a credit card is very tempting. Because once you found out that I paid this bill and it's taken care of now, you might get tempted to go ahead and say, oh, I'll just pay the minimum this month. Instead of paying the whole 100, I'll just pay the 20. And then the $80 that's remaining, that's where they charge the interest on it. So at that point, that's when the payment isn't the same anymore. You get me? Yeah. So that's why it's better to do something that's really manageable. Don't do something that's too much like, oh, I'm gonna put $300 on it and I'll pay off this $300 every month. Do something small, like something like a, a gas payment. Like, all right, gas payment, I'm ready prepared to pay that back or a cell phone payment. There are some credit cards or um, some places will lend you the money and tell you, I will lend you this money because you've been with this for so long and I'm not going to charge you interest rate until one year. So if they do that, then it's better for you to pay it within that within that year so that interest rate won't hit that's true and i wanted to say because not all of them are you know lending you constantly charging you interest rate right away some mm -hmm. give you a special offer where they say i'm going to give you this mm -hmm. how can you manage this the only thing that i'll tell you to be careful with that Whenever they do that, where they're saying a zero down interest loan for like one year, that's what they'll, they'll say, zero interest for one year. The thing about that that you want to be careful with, furniture loans, credit cards, they all do that. But if you don't pay it off within that one year, they hit you with a very hefty interest rate. Very hefty. So that's what I'm saying. It's better for you to just take a credit card that you can manage. Now, let's say you had a $9,000 debt, like a $9,000 card, that, and you had 20% on that card. And now you're saying, all right, well, instead, I want to take a 0%, a one-year 0% credit card so that I'm paying no interest on it. That's cool, but your budget has to be in place for you to repay that before that one year is out. Because otherwise, they're going to hit you really hard by the time you hit month 13. So that's why I'm always saying be careful with that. Now, last few things I'll tell you guys is, of course, I mentioned length of accounts, new credit. Every time you apply for credit, it affects you. Now, if you have somebody who always comes in and is always asking you for money, what's your concept? What are you going to do? Stay away from them. Deny them. You're going to say no, right? Same concept. Sometimes how this person pays you back. 
It does. Please do on time. That's the first part. That's what's really important with uh, your credit report. But I think she just said, I'm sorry, but I think she was saying, all right, you come to me. What's up, Mo? Can I borrow $20? All right, yeah, this is 20 Because you always pay me back. You come back and you give me the $20 the next day. But then every other day, you borrow the 20 for me. Now, I know you are going to come back and give me $20. Yeah. But, you know, is that a negative thing? Is that a reaction? Because now it's like, okay, you always borrowing, but you're always paying back. But that's, that's the first part that we handle when we talked about building a relationship with a financial institution and everything. That's, a, for example, I, I have my credit cards with you, with a financial institution. So when I go back to them and I say, well, I need a car loan. I have a relationship with them. Most likely they're gonna be like, you know, I see you pay your credit card every month. You're making enough money. You can pay me back. Cool, I'll, I'll give you the loan. Um, I'll give you the house loan. I'll give you the business loan because I know that you'll pay me back. But it's different when, let's say these are four lenders right here, right? And one month I come and I say, can I borrow $1,000 from Elizabeth? Elizabeth went ahead and she looked at my um, credit report and she says, I don't pay people back. She says, no. I come to Lucky, I ask him again, he says no. She says no, she says no. Now one of the things, let's say this person improves their credit score and you know they get it back to a point where people wanna lend to them or banks wanna lend to them. One of the things that a lender's gonna ask them is, why were you asking for credit so much between this time period? Because on your credit report, there's a part that says inquiries. Inquiries lets me know that you're always asking for money. So one of the things that you want to be careful for, inquiries stay on your credit report for two years. So if you're going to, uh, for a car loan, every financial institution that you go to is going to show up if you ask them for a loan. Is it the same thing when, they, when you go to pay or they're like, oh, we'll give you 10% off, you want to apply for a credit card? And I'm like, no, yes, you It is. That's going to be an inquiry. That's going to be an inquiry. Yeah. It's going to be a hard inquiry. Now, there's two types of inquiries. There's hard inquiries and there's soft inquiries. A hard inquiry is when you go to a certain bank or you go to a certain retail store and you apply for a credit card, you apply for a car loan, whatever type of loan you've applied for, that's called a harder inquiry. A soft inquiry. A soft inquiry is, for instance, some, some of you probably have received in the mail credit card offers, right? And you're like, why are they offering me credit card offers? So here's one thing that credit bureaus do. They sell information to financial institutions. So when they sell that information, basically Bank of America might say, well, I want information on people in Houston who has a credit score between 700 to 800 so that I can offer them credit scores. That's an inquiry, but it's a soft inquiry. It doesn't impact you. A place like Macy's or CJ Ma or TJ Maxx, yeah, TJ Maxx, <laughs> or TJ Maxx, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to be a loyal member to their store. Now, one thing about it is, and you becoming a loyal member, since you have that credit card, they're gonna send you special offers throughout the year. Now they have contact with you. Now, the point where they start to make money on you is once you let that payment, that once that cycle ends and you've only paid a portion, instead of paying the full thing that you borrowed for that month, that's where they start to hit you with 25% interest uh, rates. Because where they make money on their credit card is the actual interest rate. So they want you to carry a balance from month to month. You see what I'm saying? Everybody clear on that? It takes forever to finish. To pay them back. Once that interest rate hits, you're like, why does it go down? Yeah. Well, they charge, well, retailers, what we call retail cards, Old Navy, uh, Macy's, um, different mall, you know, different, different stores that's in the mall. They charge a very high interest rate if you're carrying a balance from month to month. So that's where you want to be careful for. Anything where you're applying for, you should ask them. Like you go shopping and they're like, you should sign up for this car, you should sign up for this car. Ask them, is this going to be a pull on my credit, re credit report? Is this an actual credit card or is this a rewards card? That way you don't get caught and you're like, wait, I didn't do this inquiry. Yeah. What about those? <laughs> is it good to have more than one credit card? It is. It is. It's actually good, not in a sense of having nine. One thing, I'm not going to say having more than one credit card, but it's good to have more than one account on your credit report. So every, any mixture of things, let's say it's a credit card or you have a student loan or you have a car loan on there. 
when you have a mix of credit right here, types of credit use, a credit mix. They call that the credit mix. So not right now while you're in college. If you only have one credit card right now, stick with one, your one credit card. But as you get older, one of the things that banks are going to look at when, when you come to them for a mortgage loan or whatever the case may be, one of the things they're going to look at, they're going to say, well, how do you manage multiple sources of credit? You see, a credit card is a short-term form of credit. It's short-term. You, at the end of the day, you borrow and you pay it right back. Now, a student loan is something that's going to last for 10 years, so that helps me to evaluate you on whether you're going to pay back something that's over one year, because a credit card is really consumed within one year. Or a housing loan or a car loan, it shows me a different look at you. So it's good to have a good credit mix, but am I telling you, to, uh, forcing you to go get multiple credit cards? No. That happens over time. For instance, when I was in college, I had one credit card. When I graduated car college, I got an additional credit card. I didn't get my first car loan until last year. And before I had that car loan, I had my student loans on there. So it shows a good credit mix. So if I go to a mortgage, uh, if I go apply for a mortgage right now, they'll be able to see he has multiple lines of credit and he's paying it on time. To finish up, make all your payments on time. Do not use too much of your available credit. Um, do not excessively apply for credit. Don't just apply for credit every month or you're constantly going to stores and applying for credit. Last thing, everybody, copy this website down, annualcreditreport.com. One of the more important sites that you need. It basically will tell you what is your credit report. This is where you get your free credit report per year. Now, basically, they'll let you order three reports when you go on there because they're going to have TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. I always tell people, order TransUnion first in January. Let's say it's based on the whole full year. You can order TransUnion first in January. And then probably in like May, go ahead and order your Experian. And then probably in like September, order your Equifax. And how much? They're free through annualcreditreport.com. Well, remember, there's three credit bureaus, but you get one from each of them per year. So that's why I'm saying just to make sure that everything's accurate on it, do your TransUnion first. If you make a dispute with TransUnion, usually what they'll do is they'll update your, uh, they'll update your credit report with TransUnion, but they'll also send it to the other creditors. And it, then let's say in May, when you apply for Experian, you'll check if the changes have been made. And then after that, you do the same thing for Equifax. So when you're looking at your credit bureaus, the way they started off in calculating credit scores is they started off with a FICO, something called FICO. FICO is Fair Isaac and Company. They came up with a math formula to look at your credit bureau and to take your credit report information, process it, and then say, all right, based off of this information, this is your credit score. Everybody got me? So it's not as accurate, is that what you're saying? It's not what banks are looking at. It's not what banks are looking at. You see, what banks usually look at, they look at FICO scores. That's what they're looking for. Now, the something mathematical like, equation. The mathematical See, equation. How much, how much you spent, how much you paid back, how much you haven't paid back, and this is your percent. Yup, and this is what your credit score will be. Now, something like Credit Karma, they have their own scoring model. See right here? TransUnion scoring model isn't what the banks are seeing, but what the, what Credit Karma is basically giving you is giving you an estimate of where you would stand. So is it good? I do think it's good as far as tracking yourself and seeing your credit report every month because it does give you updates on what has changed in your credit report, but it's not going to show you a score that the bank is actually seeing. It, it lets you see the whole thing. So one thing that you do want to know is you want to know what's your actual FICO score. Anytime that you're ordering a credit score, you want to know what's your FICO score because that's what banks use primarily. Annualcreditreport.com is actually mandated by the federal government so that you can check what's, your credit, what's on your credit report every year. Just in case there's inaccurate information, you can dispute it, but they don't give you scores. Usually you would have to actually go to a credit bureau and say, hey, I want to know what's my FICO score. Because that's the score that they use primarily. Now, one thing you can do, just in case, no, not go there, but you know, you could call or go online. Yeah. Oh. 
But one thing you can do is also ask, like let's say you're thinking about borrowing from a specific bank. Like if I want to borrow from Bank of America, right? They have a pretty nice loan and I think my, I see my credit report, I repay everything on time. One of the things that you can ask Bank of America is, hey, how do you make your credit decisions? What credit bureau do you use? Because one thing about banks is not all of them use all three. Sometimes they'll just use their TransUnion score. So now you want to say, do, what do you use to like make your credit decisions? Are you using TransUnion? Are you using Experian? Are you using Equifax? Because then you know exactly what credit report are they going to look at. All right. So that's pretty much everything that I have for you today. Um, anybody who's looking to establish credit right now, you can start off with something as simple as a secure credit card where you put money down. Because one thing is, when you apply for a credit card without having a credit history, a lot of times they deny you. So one thing that you could do is go with a secured credit card. Now, the reason why they call it a secured credit card is you're coming to the table with like, let's say $500. You have $500 that you save, and you give it to the bank and you say, open a savings account in my name, I'm not going to touch this $500. What they'll do in turn is they're gonna lock it and they're gonna give you a $500 credit card. Is their security interest, meaning that they're secure. Just in case you don't repay this credit card, they'll take that $500 back from you. That's why they call it a secure credit card. Now, you manage that credit card for about six months to a year. At that point, they're willing to go ahead and give you your $500 savings back to you, and they will give you an unsecured credit card. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So just in case you're looking to establish credit, that's one way. Um, also, you could become an authorized user on somebody else's account. So let's say your mom has a credit card or a car loan, maybe they'll include your name on it and now you're getting credit, you're building credit that way. Another way, uh, find a co-signer. Just in case you, they're looking at you and they're like, you know, we would give you the loan, but we don't see that you have enough credit. But if Lucky has good credit and I'm like starting off my credit, if Lucky's willing to co-sign and say, if Joel doesn't repay you, you can, I, you can come to me to repay you. At that point, then they'll give me a credit card as well. Huh? What happens to the cosigner? The, co the cosigner has to trust you. Because if you don't repay it, then the, they go after the cosigner. They, they have the right. They have a right. They have the right because at that point, point that person agreed to be a cosigner. Yeah. They have to sign off on the paperwork also. Yeah. You're actually saying if something happens to you, I will take over from here. That's why they're co-signing and being there. If they do it, it's because they're more, more emotionally attached to you and saying, I'm going to help you with this. But be, I would say be careful with that, of course. That's, but that's the difference between a reference and a co-signer. A reference is like, Lucky applies for a loan and then the bank calls me and say, so what do you think about Lucky's character? Is he somebody who goes to work on time? Does he repay his loans? Does he do this? Does he do that? I'm just his reference. But as a co-signer, I'm actually going in with him. I'm saying, yeah, he's going to pay this back. That's everything for today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You can contact me, Joel Philiston, 713-718-2006. Once again, that phone number is 713-718-2006. Or you can feel free to email me. It's going to be joel, J-O-E-L, um, dot Philiston, which is P-H-I-L-I-S-T-I-N, at hccs.edu.